Back on the podcast, I am your host Shane Hayes, and coming up on this episode, we're joined once again by filmmaker Kyle Smith, and new this week, the Chicago-based comedy writer performer Dustin Lavelle, who, those of you know, is an old, old friend of the show. Uh, we're discussing this week the SNL director Tom Schiller's lone feature, "Nothing Lasts Forever," which w- was originally supposed to be released in September 1984. And it's only been shown recently in the last 10 to 15 years. But first up, just an interesting uh, story I heard from this week. So if you're familiar with uh, Vampira, the character, I'm ba- I'm wholly unfamiliar with her except for her appearance in uh, Tim Burton's Ed Wood film. But her name's Molly and Nermi, and she has a biography that was written by, I think it's her niece coming out recently called Glamour Ghoul. And one story I had to share this week that I saw on Twitter. So allegedly she had an affair with Orson Welles, got pregnant by Orson Welles, and put the child up for adoption, and mentions this throughout the book. And after the book came out, the author, uh, Vampira's niece, looked up the son on Ancestry.com and found out the guy's named David Putter and he's a 75-year-old retired attorney and he was 75 years old and then found out that his biological parents are Vampira and Orson Welles. Yeah, that just seemed like a story that needed relating to more people this week. Uh, but otherwise, what I watched this week, not much interesting. I rewatched uh, To Catch a Thief, uh, which mainly it was interesting it's fun the i always forget that the big sequence in there the big um the the or- orchestra sequence in there it happens in the middle of the movie and there's a lot left to go after that sequence is done but it prompted if you've never seen it look up on youtube scorsese did a uh com- long form commercial i want to say in like 2008 called the key to reserva and to be fair the whole commercial, the long form commercial, is not worth watching because it's very, it's got a lot of fashionable mockumentary stuff in the middle of it of Scorsese making the supposedly long lost Hitchcock script. But in the middle of the movie, it's Scorsese doing his best to ape Hitchcock. And it's very much based around the orchestra, orchestra sequence in To Catch a Thief. And it's definitely worth watching. What else I watched this week? I finally got around to watching uh, The Great Santini, the Robert Duvall movie. And while I try not to talk negatively about movies, uh, even if that movie is now, what, um, almost 41 years old, 42 years old, uh, there's still people involved who are around making it. So uh, it came up on the uh, the episode uh, with uh, Swing Shift with Julia Block because we were talking, I was talking about... William Goldman in his book Adventures in Screen Trade he describes a a scene in 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 Great Santini about how brave Robert Duvall was to make himself be a lead actor a star performer and look like an asshole and so watching the movie I yeah it, there wasn't a deft, subtle touch in the movie, let's just say that. But And part of that was interesting, it's going to come up on this episode, was Elmer Bernstein did the music to it. And he, this is also the period of time where I want to say he did stri- the music to Stripes, and a lot of his music was put in the same tone of unsubtlety that over these dramas was put into comedies, and th- that forthrightness like added to like the, the I don't know, the me generation mockery of uh sincerity and um yeah there's this just synthine bizarreness to it that the score really hurt the movie and uh not to give it too much of a modern shitting on but um to, so this week we're discussing nothing lasts forever and a few things i forgot to mention on the episode itself there's a book that uh, i think was a big part of the resurgence of this movie called Nothing Lost Forever by Michael Streeter. 
and also this movie is also not based on the book that Die Hard is based on, which is also called Nothing Lasts Forever. But uh, among other things, with Mank supposedly maybe up for some Oscars right now and all this big deal being made about how that movie's supposed to feel like it was made in its time period, one basic thing about Nothing Lasts Forever is it does feel like a time capsule movie. It feels like it was made years ago and is now just seeing the light of day, which helps a little by the fact that it was supposed to come, it was delayed its release uh, just weeks before it was supposed to come out in 1984, as Dustin will point out on the episode, at the height of a lot of these comedy players' stardom and beginning. Like it came out just right before Ghostbusters, or was supposed to have come out before Ghostbusters. And as far as we can tell, this, we get into this into the episode, I believe this is Lauren Michaels' first narrative produced feature, which in itself, anyway, we, we get into this in the episode, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating movie. So I hope you enjoy this. I got a feeling this is going to be a super long episode just because like I have like three pages of really small handwriting notes. And it looks like that makes me look like I'm trying to like find the Zodiac killer on a board somewhere. Like I just I did a I did a, the deep dive and realized, oh, talking about SNL was we could have done a separate episode on each of these topics, one just on movies that have come from SNL and directors that have come from SNL and one on this movie itself so it's gonna be it's gonna be long so kyle you've been on this show before but dustin you so you've you've directed a few plays in chicago you directed um a play a version of mark mcdonough's the pillow man i saw a few years ago and liked and um you've written you've written some stuff around but you and you but basically you've been in around Chicago's comedy scene for like 15 years now. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, so when I started driving up when I was, I was still in college. So it was like 2001. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's crazy. I mean, I don't know. I want to be careful not to like get into like a weird name droppy kind of thing on the show, but like, it was like, Oh, that's never <laughs> happened on the show before. So, okay, but like, but like it was like yeah it's like oh yeah so when I was going up it was like Keegan Michael Key was on on the Second City stage that we'd go see and um, like Seth Meyers had like just gone to SNL uh, but he was like still hanging around like uh, Second City all the time so he was like the kid that kept coming back to high school and like so but it was it was I remember visiting you and seeing Jason Sudeikis like the year before he went to SNL yeah 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 he came out of the um, the, the Vegas crew but like was still. In, in Chicago, because he has a lot of Chicago connections. His uncle is George Wint and all that. So. <laughs> George Wint's going to come up later in this episode. <laughs> the other reason is you're one of my oldest friends. Yeah. And we, before, uh, we both left Evansville uh, for about t 10 weeks. You and I, every Sunday, um, would drive up to Chicago yeah. and back from Evansville, which is a six-hour trip one yeah. way. So we drove up and drove back in the day. You had the afternoon uh, Second City classes, and I had night uh, sketch writing classes. What, I, what was your class? Um, so at that point, I was probably like doing the intro levels of um, uh, the conservatory. So I did like I think the first like two levels of that, and then you have to like audition to go on. Uh, and then I took a break to like actually move to Chicago after I graduated. And when I came up, they're like, it's like that episode of The Office where Michael uh, Michael Scott's like, I don't know if my improv credits will transfer or whatever. So they're like, they made you like <laughs> retake the class or whatever. I had to retake some class or whatever. So uh, at that point, then I went straight through the conservatory uh, program. Yeah, I do love when I tell people this story, I do tell that it was like 12 weeks and we both decided the last week when we had to do the final, we were both like, eh, let's not do this because it was a fucking like we get up at 4 a.m and get home at like 6 a.m monday yeah, it's, morning it's, do uh, it. it was yeah it was definitely very draining after a while and I, I remember like i mean those were back in the days before there were like smartphones before even i guess there was ipods but i remember i would have to like spend saturday like burning cds that like i stole off the internet and i would like listen to like a lot of comedy albums i would listen to a lot of plays things that like would 
go easy on the on the long drive and stuff like that yeah yeah i mean the the second city center i remember was right next to a movie indie movie Uh, theater and i remember i would see i would see movies in the afternoon uh, piper's alley right was it it's piper's alley but that's all gone now yeah i I used to live i lived briefly in chicago i went to college in uh in in the northwestern and then i lived at north and halstead Mm -hmm. and then i did not know this kyle Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was in I was in Chicago. I was doing Chicago things from 2002 to 2007 until I moved here. I live in Los Angeles. Did you have any it. comedy overlap, or did you do did you go to Second City shows and stuff? I went to Second City. I mean, I went to that movie theater a lot. Um, my sister, like I was gonna say, my sister lives at. Uh, I still know the grid a little. Bit. She's at North. She's at like third or thirteen something North North Park. So she's right around the corner from where all that stuff was. And last time I visited her, I was like, oh my god, it's all gone. Um, yeah, I went to Second City shows. I was more like doing movies. I lived across from Steppenwolf. Like literally, yeah. if you left my apartment and walked across the street, you would walk into Steppenwolf. Yeah. So um, I did. Of course, I didn't go that much because like, whatever. Good. I didn't go. <laughs> I was taking advantage of it. Poor yeah. college student. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, Dustin, had you heard of this movie, uh, Nothing Lasts Forever, before we brought it up? Because it's come up in SNL history before. But I, I, I was looking through the. Um, Live from New York oral history book, and I don't think it's mentioned in that book at all. Wait, is this actually the podcast? Are we actually recording? I thought this was like just like an intro. No, <laughs> we're going. Oh no, we're totally in. We're like we're a few <laughs> minutes in, bud. Do I do the Mark Mark Marin joke of like, yeah, we've been recording. Uh, okay, so then, uh, yeah, no, I had not never heard of this, and so when you suggested it, and I felt a little bamboozled to to, to be honest, because you're like, oh, we're gonna watch this um, <laughs> this movie. It's called Nothing Lasts Forever. So first, it sounds like a James Bond film. Um, right. Or like a documentary about Guns N' Roses or something, and then um, then you're like it's a, it's like one of Bill Murray's uh, like movies that you've like never heard of or whatever. So I had never I had I had I knew nothing about it. So I which is always great. I like I, I'm somebody that doesn't like to watch trailers and things like that. Right. Um, so I go in cold. Yeah. I mean, Kyle, I had heard of this and wanted to see it, but one of the reasons I thought to do this episode is I remember there was a point you said this was your discovery of I want to say it was like 2014 or something like that. Or I remember you saying it was one of the best movies you've seen in a while. Yeah, I, lo- I actually looked up when I saw it. I saw it in 2010. Uh, it played it played it to the, cin- the former Cine family, but I saw it at the American Cinematheque, uh, the, the Egyptian here in Los Angeles, and it was part of a like forgotten film series. And they showed a number. They showed this and a number of um, Schiller's like uh, SNL shorts as like a as like a block. And do you remember any of the sh- the shorts? I do. In fact, I in, in preparing for this, I found one of my favorite one, which is called uh, "Sushi by the Pool." Um, I ended up. I didn't know you could do this. I bought it. You can buy SNL episodes on Amazon for a dollar ninety nine, and this is from season four, episode one. Um, and so I was, I wanted to revisit it, so I just bought it. <laughs> I bought the whole episode. It has the Rolling Stones on it, doing Beast of oh, Burden. Oh wow! Um, but. Nice. Uh, yeah, I mean it's crazy the songs and everything, but um, it's just this little two and a half minute Schiller thing that I, I remember like popping for me. But for me, when I saw the movie at that time, it was like a you know one of those discovery. I'd never heard of it. Like you, Dustin, here's it's playing down the street. Uh, let's go check it out, knowing nothing about it, and then was sort of blown away by it. Okay. Yeah. Can we talk about the so I, I so one of the things that like stuck out to me is I want to talk about. The fact that no one's heard of it because it's never been released. Right. And can I talk about, like, what a big deal that I think that, like, that's one of the things that, like, blew my mind, like, watching the movie and then, like, looking up a little bit about it. That if, okay, so it was filmed in, like, probably, what, 83 or 84 because it was supposed to be released in September of 1984. And they announced, like, a few weeks before it was supposed to come out that it's not coming out. And so, yeah, in the movie, right, so the main character is Zach Galligan, or mm-hmm. that's his name, right? The... Mm-hmm. Is the right Zach Galligan, who's an unknown, let's say at that time, and he, he filmed this first, and then he filmed Gremlins next. Exactly, and then in the in the cast, you have both Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray, uh, plus you know like some other old you know Eddie Fisher and Mort Saul, and those people are uh, rounding out the cast. But in June of 1984, you would have uh, the same weekend Gremlins opens and also Ghostbusters. So you have. Yeah. Two monumental, huge movies, and then they have this movie sitting ready to go in September, and they, the studio must have hated it so much to be like, ah, we're still not going to release well, it. Well, the weirder thing I was trying to, I can't confirm, but because going through his uh, Lauren Michaels IMDb list, I think this is Lauren Michaels' first produced narrative feature, because you, like, he's executive producer on a lot of... 
he was executive producer on the Ruddles. Um, he, but he, mm-hmm. most of the stuff he's got his name on on IMDb is all this concert or stand-up special stuff. And right. Three Amigos was supposed to be his big first movie that he co-wrote, right? And produced, and that's like '86. So this is his first produced feature, and like three weeks before. And Zach Galligan, the closest I have for a reason why it's not just that the studio hated it. The weirdest thing about it is you guys notice that there's all these. The characters are watching different movies, and there's all these different old songs throughout it. I mean, you have at one point Unchained Andalus in this. There's a sequence where they go over Battleship with Timken. Um, Mm -hmm. I think I recognize Intolerance in here too. No one cleared these. (laughs) The clearance issue was apparently the reason why, and at least according to Zach Galligan. And I think that's why we started seeing this movie around 2005, maybe 2010, because I think those things went into public domain, yeah. which Kyle and I were talking about right before oh, okay. uh, so okay. you got on, Dustin. <laughs> Kyle, I mean, what it, when you saw it, what drew you to it? I was I was reflecting on this. I actually found um, I went with my one of my best friends, and him and I over the years have like talked about that experience. I think what uh, appeals to me about the movie then appealed to me then, and rewatching it this week is the sort of sense of boundless imagination that I think is mostly in the first act, first half hour of just like oh, we're just going to keep piling on genre and bits, right. and gimmicks and references and physical comedy and do it all through this sort of crazy lens that was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And I, and, you know, I think there is an element of, you know, the, as Dustin said, like the, um, it being something that's never been seen or, you know, unearthed to it. And the fact that it looks the way it does and like, you know, our manner of watching it was probably, you know, not totally on the up and up, but it's the only way to see it is this like record. Did you see a print of it? Was it a good? Yeah, it was a print. Um, I, I can't recall if it was good, but it was definitely like, it was better than what we watched. I'll, I'll say that. Um, but I'm pretty sure it was, a- I have a, I have a bad DVD rip. It, it played a few years ago at, uh, I think Dustin, I sent you an Austin film society trailer of this. It yeah, played- I saw the, I saw the, or that article where it played the Alamo or, or for the, yeah, it pl- but played the Marquesa one oh, okay. or right. Like I want to say it was like on a December 23rd when I had driven back to Indiana, when I still lived in Austin, but I had driven back and I was in Indiana when it played. And I think Tom Schiller was actually at the screening doing a Q and a, but this would have been yeah. like yeah. five years mm-hmm. ago, I think, or something like that. Um, let's go into a little bit about Tom Schiller just because he's, he, I mean, like he's a founding SNL guy. Like he was, so his dad is a guy named Bob Schiller, who was uh, a writer for, uh, in radio, he wrote for Abbott and Costello and Ozzie and Harriet. But when he went to TV, he wrote for, I love Lucy, Maude, all in the family. And in the sixties, he was writing for a show called the beautiful Phyllis Diller. And one of the junior writers on that was Lorne Michaels. And that's his right. dad introduced um, Bob Schiller, introduced Tom Schiller to Michaels and said, um, this junior writer knows all the best restaurants in Los Angeles. So they became friends over the years and Schiller hung out with Lorne Michaels at the Chateau Marmont or where, and whatever Michaels was doing when he was doing TV in LA. And when he started to get the prospect of uh, Saturday Night Live maybe happening, There's this story they tell in both um, the oral history and in the Saturday Night book where they go to um, they go to Joshua Tree and uh, do mushrooms. But Tom Schiller fakes doing the mushrooms and doesn't do them. And uh, Lauren Michaels is sitting there talking on the phone um, to actual NBC executives. And Schiller in the Saturday Night book has an excerpt from his journal at the time. And he says, I'm being auditioned for this job as Lauren's assistant in, assistant in New York, the NBC late night show. All my dreams of power, wealth, and TV glory seem to crystallize in images I imagine or am made to ina- imagine. The RCA building at 30 Rockefeller Plaza looms like neon magnets of the mind. Banks of gleaming Art Deco elevators ready to whisk me to the studio and the office of my choice. Now, having seen the movie and the first act you're talking about, Kyle... Does this sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, like, well, the, my, my girlfriend had never seen it, and I neither of us could stop laughing, 
could not stop laughing at the um, the the bald face. I almost want to see someone else do a movie like this. The the bald faced. Um, so you want to be an artist? I'm an artist. Like the, the treating an artist as like an entry level job, like becoming a um, you know like a like a toll like a toll toll, toll booth person, which he ends up becoming. Very bureaucratic, uh, in or out type position. You know, it's, it's like the movie immediately announces that it's about like the artistic, like, like, like c- commercializing, commodifying the artistic idea of um, of what it means to be an artist, and like the fact that Zach Galligan's character can't decide if he's going to be a painter or a or a pianist or <laughs> or whatever. Like he just has this vague concept of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, to your point, it totally checks out that Schiller is like obsessed with with this idea, and you know, a lot of stuff I read, and I'm sure you saw this too. He he can he likes to he likes to call himself a foreign film director, which is a which is a uh-huh, which is a yeah. great like self deprecating but also pretentious thing to be like, oh, I'm gonna I yeah, my dad yeah. like wrote for I Love Lucy, and and I grew up in L.A. Sort of this first generation Hollywood royal, or maybe second generation Hollywood royalty. Um, but I want to make foreign films. And so it's like, even he seems to project an idea of himself as an artist. Um, that is like, he's doubtful of it, of the entire idea. Well, well, the crazier thing is a lot of his European love comes from the fact that he was considered Henry Miller's surrogate son. Henry Miller was living in the Pacific Palisades at the time he had been doing a documentary. That was what he was doing in LA and Henry Miller took to him and Henry Miller tried to convince him not to go out to, New York for SNL even. Um, Dustin, what did, what did you think of the movie? I mean, because I, I got a feeling... So I, I came into it, I came into it like, again, blank slate, and I didn't even remember exactly who Tom Schiller was. I just right. recognized the name from SNL. And as soon as the movie starts, so the movie starts, uh, again, in a very like, it, it's a, a throwback. We're going to have the credits at the beginning. It's black and white. We have this big Howard uh, Howard Short is the this the, the like you know orca orchestral kind of thing. So it's like a very like as far as I can tell, I think this is Howard Shore's first. He did one movie that wasn't a Cronenberg movie, but this is really Howard Shore's first non Cronenberg movie score. Yeah, and so as movie as soon as the movie starts and the opening scenes like I, I, they're at Carnegie Hall and he's like doing the piano, but it's like a player piano yeah. kind of bit or whatever. But as soon as that happened, I knew exactly who Tom Schiller was from his work in SNL. Like, be like, oh, he did the Dolce Gilda. He did the uh, Perchance to Dream, with the the Phil Hartman, Jan Hooks. So all those little short films that are uh, honestly not funny in most cases, but like in a way that are supposed to like make you smile and feel good and have like a very different tone to that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I rewatched uh, uh, Love is a Dream like two days ago and I had forgotten all about it. And it's exactly like you described. Oh, yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's so yeah. wistful. It's so, it makes you feel good. The other uh, funny one I hadn't, short of his, I hadn't seen. He did, he did the, for a while, when he was first on SNL, he did Schiller's Reels and then they started to change to Schiller Vision. But a late, and he it was on there from like 77 with the Michael's Gap. He was there till 93 when he got fired. But he did this amazing one with Chris Farley. Do you guys remember this? Where uh, th- it was the changing out the coffee. Where it's like, do you know what type of coffee you're drinking? It's my favorite GIF. Maybe my favorite oh. GIF or GIF in the world is that Chris Farley like look of recognition <laughs> that he's been tricked. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I have not seen it in forever, and it's funny how it's. He, I want to say he's like a Swedish director in it, even too. He's still a foreign director and yeah yeah, i laugh so he's so but he i think he's somebody that i i don't know i mean so it it sounds so he was he joined snl as a writer he wrote the first samurai hotel with uh for john belushi right he didn't write any of the other ones but oh he didn't write any other ones okay i think the rest were buck henry but i'm pretty sure he only did the the first one Uh, i think i did downey take over some of them after a certain point or something like that because i saw that they they did a story where they were walking around and i think he just the idea came to him when he was walking with belushi or something like that uh so belushi did the uh samurai character in his audition for snl Mm -hmm. but i don't think there was any context and then i think schiller kind of made it the uh, like a more of an homage to a samurai movie. They were walking by a hotel with... and they tried to call it a samurai uh, hotelier. And Michael's was yeah. like, just make it a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think Tom Schiller might be somebody that's kind of like, uh, like Jim Downey or Robert Smiley or somebody that had like a, a short, or even Al Franken that had like a short tenure at SNL, but like later would just kind of pop in and just be the guy that like 
was like pitch hit or like pinch hitting for certain sorts of things. I don't know that he was in the writer's room on Tuesday nights until 2 a.m. Mm. I mean, maybe, maybe he was. I mean, so like when you look at his filmography or his um, IMDb, like it looks like he's been hanging out at SNL all those years, but I don't think he's like pushing to get sketches on <laughs> the screen like other people are. There was a quote in Life from New York of when he came back, with uh, when Michaels came back, where when he was doing his first films, he said he was left alone. And then when he came back, they assigned a, a, a junior writer to him, and he felt like uh, there was a guy watching him to make sure he was working the entire time. Oh, what, yeah. what what year? What uh, years is Lauren Michaels not at SNL? Uh, eighty to eighty five, okay. I think. Yeah, so I'm saying. And and Tom Schiller is actually a featured player, you know, in that last year of the first generation. I saw that, and I couldn't. I was looking at list and didn't see it. It was it was it would have been his last uh, Michaels last year. He I, was. So if yeah, so again, like the the SNL history. I mean, and this would like you said, this could be a whole podcast unto itself to talk about all these things. But so the that first generation. So Chevy Chase left after the first year, and Bill Murray was kind of the replacement. But the the original not ready for prime time players. By the end of that fifth year, they weren't really there. They were kind of like everybody had like movie deals, and they were moving on to bigger well, things. Well, Ackroyd and Belushi left, and there was that period in like '78 where Harry Shearer came in early before he came back in later. Yeah, Harry Shearer. So I think they had like a, a people that were like kind of writers that like got sort of elevated to like, oh, maybe this should be our next mm. generation kind of thing. Because there was at that point there was no template for what the cycle for SNL would be like rotating out new cast members and things. And Michael's made a big deal about the fact that writers are performers themselves too. Like when Gene, Gene Dominion, who's uh, Michael's replacement came on, one of the first things he said was, well, she's a producer. She's not a writer. So how she's going to know what's funny. Yeah. 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 So then everybody kind of like, there was kind of a uh, big slaughter or whatever kind of in the, in that 80 year. And that was kind of, uh, the the year that Charlie Rocket and all those people kind of came on and, and no disrespect to anybody that was in that 1980s year but uh, yeah like you know it, it was it was like you know all these new faces and it was a complete like there was no transition really from the old to the new I think except for I think Harry Shearer might have been somebody that had worked in the old one I'm kind of I'm kind of curious if there's going to be a revisionist history soon for Jean Dominion that like people think that she just got a bad shake because I don't think she even finished out her first full year but at the same time for such a distinctly male environment that was notorious and every time you read the histories of it it comes out like the Tina Fey, Amy Poehler seemed to kind of get a lot of that out of the system, but just even the framing of these stories, like like one of uh, Schiller's uh, movies I watched was Don't Look Back in Anger, his shorts with uh, John Belushi, where right. John Belushi survives everyone else <laughs> and he visits everyone's yeah. grave. And I was reading the text of it on after having seen it, all the women, the whole thing, the joke is like they get married somewhere and go insane or have a plastic surgery uh, accident. Right. Like, is. And I wonder if Dominion's going to have um, a day in the sun off this. but um, So going back to the beginning of this, the other thing I for completely forgot about when I was re -re researching this, in theory, SNL started, uh, they went to Albert Brooks first, and I think in conjunction with Lauren Michaels, and we're talking to Albert Brooks about being the permanent host because they hadn't settled on the idea of alternating hosts. And Albert Brooks was trying to get out of it, and he'd started doing some filmmaking, and he said, oh, I'll contribute films and that first year it was um gary weiss albert brooks albert brooks was the main draw and then schiller and then weiss left i think albert brooks didn't last a year weiss lasted maybe two or three years and schiller was basically the main filmmaker the segment filmmaker at snl uh, starting around what 77 or so right and I, I would say, I mean, what about the Muppets? Like, who was it? Like the like those were kind of also they got they, did they last a year or did they go into the second year? They might have been like a year and a half, but they kind of got faded out. But I, I I think like at least Schiller, you could kind of credit him for a lot of what became now the digital shorts and and like that style. Um, I mean, I I don't I don't really remember this. I mean, I guess it was Schiller still through the eighties and stuff. But uh, eventually, you, you kind of got into the nineties and 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 had. Uh, like the late nineties had Robert Smigel doing his like things that are very kind of different from what, you know, is happening in the, in the live show. Uh, and then of course the digital shorts and, and like now that's, it's kind of the standard bearer, but I, I, I like these short little films but are so completely different though than like going for a punch and punch lines and stuff like that. 
Um, I also love the story that like with the La Dolce Gilda that he showed it to Bergman or whatever. Like he's just like so obsessed. I hadn't with, heard uh, the story. Yeah, yeah. Like there was like a yeah, like like I think that was I think the, the Gilda one was like one of his second and it's like just kind of a, a Bergman ripoff kind of thing, but like There's a yeah. uh he mentioned this, that De Palma is actually Brian De Palma is actually in La Dolce Gilda. <laughs> Like oh, he just happened know. to be at the <laughs> SNL after party and he was like, Brian De Palma is very intimidating. Yeah. Well, can I, can I ask a question? You, you guys, you guys know a lot more about this than I do. And I'm, I'm sort of sitting here just like, whoa. Um, what are, what were Brooks's shorts like that he did? The SNL shorts. I don't remember any of them. There one mention was like, uh, so the joke was he his first one he submitted, uh, Michael's never aired because it was tw- Michael said it was twelve minutes too long, and then Rob Reiner aired it on whatever show he was doing at the time, and it was about open heart surgery. But I don't know. I don't know if they just ended up going into because I mean you know Brooks's first features aren't, you know he has the real life the fake documentary, so it makes right. sense that he would go from short to being in them but albert brooks is is somebody that's very uh i think part of it too was i I remember like a few of them um and they're very like his voice have you watched the show that's on uh the the john wilson how to oh yeah with john wilson kind of thing yeah i guess i mean that's like the most i guess like the thing like like where it's albert brooks like and he like he's narrating sort of a documentary kind of thing more so more than any sort of like a narrative type of short film uh, and the ones that I, I've seen or whatever, and, and some of it is, is probably staged and whatnot, but uh, it's, again, it's like something that's in those early years, they were just throwing stuff against the wall to see what works, you know, and this is something that like, is not necessarily bad, but it just feels so out of place from the sketch and the thing that ended up becoming like the, the, the engine of the show. I will say the, I haven't seen any of the shorts from SNL, but Albert Brooks, I think it's the real life trailer made one of the greatest film trailers of all time where it's him uh he, he he's, he's talking to the camera and he's trying to sell the movie that's going to be in 3d and it's going to turn in the trailer is going to turn to 3d at a certain point and he says all right everybody you should have 3d glasses underneath <laughs> your seat and obviously no one has 3d glasses yeah. underneath their seat so then the 3d comes up and then he takes like a ping pong battle paddle and tries to like play it towards <laughs> the camera lens and like throws confetti at it yeah it's I- it's a brilliant trailer. Albert Brooks is just beyond amazing. Like, I don't know if you've seen or listened to any of his stand-up albums. I think there might only be two or three, but like one of them is a, um, a comedy team album. And, um, but he's, he doesn't have a partner. He gives you the script and then like you play, like do your lines and like, while you're listening to the record and it like has the other part of the, <laughs> like, so you're like, you're a part of It's like, he's just very, just in an amazing sort of way. I mean, of course he's famous like from when he was a kid where um, Carl Reiner was on the tonight show and they, uh, Johnny Carson asked who the funny person he knew. And he said, Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. My my son's friends, uh, you know, uh, who's Albert Einstein at that time before he became Albert Brooks. That's so crazy. I, you know, his, his bit about the uh, improv suggestions, I never saw until it was included in uh, his movie, looking for comedy in the Muslim world. And the whole bit in the movie is that he screws up the bit, but it, I had never. I don't know that one. He does a um, he takes improv suggestions, and every time someone throws an improv suggestion, he's like, "No, I don't like that." And <laughs> he just makes his own. Up. Well, I, I was asking about uh, his shorts because I was trying to when I thinking about Nothing Lost Forever and SNL uh, and and comedy in general. It seems like SNL does two things pretty consistently throughout its whole history, which are. Um, like imitation and then I, and I guess not parody, but I'm, I'm thinking about like the Ruddles right. versus what Schiller yeah. does. Right. So the Ruddles is like, right. let's take the Beatles, but make it, you know, doing the Gary Weiss feature of it. Um, and like what later they do with pop star where they kind of are, um, I guess it's a version of satire. Sorry. That's what I'm looking for. They're, they're yeah. doing satire on pop culture, on, on other television and film media. And then you have imitation, which is clearly what Schiller excelled at. And the fact that like so much of his public persona is about foreign film director that the movie literally shows classics. It's like almost like international film canon that the entire movie is through a lens of of imitation and style. And so it's showing it's I always think about those things because 
I try to imagine what it was like in 1984 to watch an old movie, right? Like VHS is barely out. So if you're watching an old movie, you're watching it late night on television. You can only see them periodically or like maybe if you're in a city at a second run movie theater. And you know, one fascinating thing I found is when SNL was shooting these shorts on film and they were doing video transfer, it was all these 80s video transfer that's not going to get updated. So like they all look old, especially because he still shot so much in black and white, like it's black and white transfers from the early eighties. They all look very dated. Yeah. And the quality will like, never, right. They'll never get better. <laughs> like they yeah. can't like, unless they go back to the elements and they're not going. Yeah. To they can't like remaster better. these things. So it, it was, and I was just curious about how Brooks fit into that because like the, you know, the modern era, I feel like a lot of, um, uh, well, I'm trying to, of course, I'm blanking on some of the big digital shorts, but they're either like songs or that go viral, right. but, they, but they typically are like mocking or sat- sat- satirizing another form of um, things. And that's obviously this movie's doing that too. Well, I want to put this point to you guys. Um, Dustin, you mentioned earlier about something about Michael's style being just very punchy and punchline based. And I've heard in the past that one of the things he, one of his true Norths to go to is that this, things will be funny if people laugh at it. Like the audience is going to tell you if it's working because you're going to be getting laughed. It's a George Burns kind of thing. Yeah. George Burns had that like line. He's like, if it makes you laugh, it's funny. Like that was just George Burns's well, thing. Yeah. And, well, there's he, Michael's clearly considered Tom Schiller an artist. He said that, I mean, there's a reason why this is the guy he looked to, to make the first feature that if this is his first narrative feature to direct that. And th- Michael's, if you if if your true north is that co- laughter is going to get you is the only thing you're the only way you're making something good or something that works these don't get laughs and art artistic stuff has to like not going to is not going to get a visible visual or audible reaction from an audience especially if it really gets to you and or an immediate reaction like if something really works it may hit you later when you remember uh, love is a dream like a few weeks later and just think of like the look on Phil Hartman's face or how young he looks or him and Jan Hooks how young yeah. they both look in that like that's going to get to you later and so my thought is like Michael's over the years especially when when SNL began and was at its most zeitgeisty and was it, it did stuff that didn't it wasn't always getting a laugh. It did stuff that was more punk rocky and putting a finger in your eye a little. And then supposedly the Dominion, or it wasn't Gene Dominion, but Dick Ebersol who took over after her was, he was the one that was more, we need to get a more uh, reliable format. We need to redo characters over and over uh, because people will recognize them. And when Michaels came back, especially after his bad 85 year, he was like, he followed that a little and it became a little more. Yeah. I mean, I too. think you don't like, again, like, and I think that's one of the credits, I guess, to Tom Schiller is that he had such a long tenure, or maybe, I don't know if he's still throwing things out to Saturday Night Live, but uh, they had such a long tenure. Cause if, if you think like an, somebody like an Albert Brooks, you know, kind of like struck out. Um, if you remember, even Ben Stiller tried to do the films on SNL for like eight months and like, mm. just, you know, then he went on and did the Ben Stiller show. Yeah. He has that great, um, he has that great uh, color of money parody yeah. with bowling, where he got to get his uh, um, his yeah. Tom Cruise impression in. Really yeah, early. I think um, it was just it was kind of before a time when I mean, you know, that was still like the day. At least in the seventies, it was like SNL is, is like supposed to be kind of edgy and and you know that sort of thing. And then over the years, uh, and not to bash SNL in any way, it, it's like the format has changed in so that so much is so much lockstep, and now it's it's so much more political than it even was you know, 20 years ago, I think after, really after 2008, it really ramped up its politics. It used to just be, you know, one sketch maybe at the top that was sort of political, but like more about just what's happening in the, in the world. And then it, otherwise. And there's always like Jim Downey as the resident uh, Republican trying to balance everything out. Well, you, it was Jim Downey. It's like, Hey, he's going to write that sort of stuff. And it's funny because I, the people that I've talked to that have, have worked on SNL or, or have written for SNL, there's, um, there's also this weird sort of thing like you're not really supposed to know, or at least it used to be, you were not really supposed to know who wrote the sketches. They have like a sort of a mentality of like, even though it it will be like two people that write, you know, a sketch or something like that. It's like, oh, we, you know, it's kind of written in the room sort of thing. Cause I guess people still throw out jokes, something like that. But you're not really supposed to like be like, 
that's mine. And I think that's something else that sort of changed where you have, especially as things go viral and it becomes like David S. Pumpkins kind of thing or something like that, or Stefan, like you learn who the people that are that actually made it versus just that it was written by the staff of an SNL. Well, Kyle, what's your SNL cinematic feeling? Like, what's your history with... Because, I mean, do you come to the show as a joke factory? Did you feel like the performers came out of it were more that? Or did you feel some, like, genuine cinematic bona fides for, with the show at all? Or some filmmakers that came from it? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I have, I'm, I'm shuffling kind of a larger uh, pitch I want to pitch you guys about the history of SNL. I mean, growing up, this was, like, my parents liked watching SNL. And it was, you know, one of the things I was, I was allowed to stay up late and watch. Uh, I'm from Missouri, Dustin, so it came on at 10.30, which was great, and there was always the, it would play 10.30 to midnight, and then from midnight to 1 or 1.30, they would show a classic episode, so I would just watch two SNLs back-to-back, um, usually like one from the early 80s or maybe this era you're talking about, and um, the sort of, so I was a big fan of it in that era of, I don't know, 1991 to 97, 96. That's kind of like, I was going to ask, when yeah, is that, your that's SNL? That's kind of my. Lauren Michaels makes makes a point of saying that everyone's favorite cast is the cast that was whenever you're a teenager. Yeah. And of course, of course, mine, that one feels very strong. Um, but what I was I was thinking about when you mentioned, Dustin, the, the political thing and, and with this movie, it's that um, SNL got and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it kind of broke into the public consciousness because of characters, right? Samurai uh, Hotel, uh, Father Guido Sarducci, like these, um, and, and and the appeal of certain performers that were somewhat transcendent in a way, like Chevy Chase or, or Belushi, um, they were character bases. And then the films that come out of SNL, which, um, you know, like Wayne's World is a hugely important movie to me, which we yeah. can go into later, but that obviously emerges from characters. It's, it's a huge movie to us too. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, Coneheads, all those movies are based on like, oh, here's the character idea doing that. And Nothing Lasts Forever has like hardly any character. I mean, there are little fun characters in it, like what Dan Aykroyd's doing and what Bill Murray is doing, but it's not a, it's not about that. It's a, again, it's about like this imitation, this genre uh, busting, which Wayne's World gets into as well, of like defying conventions or toying with conventions that the audience is expecting. Yeah. And maybe that's not as appealing. And that's why this movie couldn't even become a try to be a hit because well, I want to I want to actually um, pose the question to you guys do you even really consider this an SNL movie because I I think like Shane I think you're giving Lauren Michaels a lot more credit on this as a producer than I think he might have actually been involved in um and I I don't know what you would consider the first SNL movie maybe Blues Brothers um but then you have this and then- which by the way guys I watched Blues Brothers for the first time from beginning to end last night oh really I have never seen it all the way through yeah, that is another good movie. That yeah, but obviously the Chicago connection there and all that. But um, but yeah, so I I think like because but Blues Brothers isn't even really like a like these are like proto SNL movies. I bet like I would think that even though like Three Amigos probably had kind of the like least kind of SNL sort of things. I think that built a framework for like what an SNL hit movie is going to be. And in this movie, I didn't see a lot of things in there. The only thing that I kind of like reminded me of anything that's sort of in the realm of like an SNL feature film was um, the, uh, at the beginning of the, the Carnegie Hall scene where the, like there's the hillbilly guy that like stands up and he's like, ah, get him or whatever. And like, that's like a very like uh, Adam Sandler, like you can see like Rob Schneider or somebody like playing that kind of, you know, um, and that's also one of the few like, you know, I'm taking a swing at a joke kind of thing in the movie. I have well, okay. Okay. There's two, there's two ways I'm going with this. One, I have to acknowledge that the movie is very, creative and inspiring and more of like Schiller's short films, right. which were a part of SNL. You have to admit that, but it's not that funny. This is not that no, funny no, no, little no, movie. No. Like there's, there's a few laughs, but there's, it's not, I didn't, it's definitely not a movie that gives a lot of audible laughs. The other one's kind of a pet theory that came up as I've been reading more about this. Schiller was Lauren Michaels guy for a while. And then when you read about the main writers of SNL right now, they talk about O'Donohue. They talk about Franken and Franken and Davis, and they talk about like uh, Jim Downey. But Schiller doesn't get mentioned. He gets mentioned as the filmmaker, but they also I also read in the Saturday Night book that when Michaels left and took the Paramount movie deal, Schiller was supposed to write his first movie, and he I mean he thought highly of Schiller. He thought Schiller was the artist, and. 
as you mentioned earlier, Dustin, this movie then got taken off the schedule three weeks before it was supposed to be released. Like, that's how much MGM didn't have faith in this when Bill Murray was going to be... Bill Murray was filming this at the same time he was filming Tootsie. Like, that's just where, where he was at. Yeah. This is right... I mean, Dan Aykroyd at that point was was probably pretty big. Bill Murray had already done uh, Stripes and Caddyshack, so he was enough of a draw. Uh, but this was, like, right before... I mean, obviously, when he was filming this... Uh, the Ghostbusters came out. You have Tootsie like that. Like this is right before. And I think Tom Schiller even talks about his relationship with Bill, Bill Murray being like, I knew him like in that little time where he was still anonymous. Yeah. Like and that. he tells him like the anonymity is not going to last. And Bill Murray like clearly has strong affection and loves and um, love for Schiller. Like the other story of like the legendary story supposedly with Bill Murray around this time is that he only did Ghostbusters with, um, it, for Columbia, if they were if they were going to do Razor's Edge, and then like he didn't do, an, Edge, which came out a month later, yeah, or in October, and then he didn't do another movie till like Little Shop of Horrors, I think, which is two years after that. Yeah, Little Shop would be eighty six, yeah. right? And he only had a, a like a, a day part, probably in that too. I mean, this like so Dan Aykroyd probably like filmed for a day in this. Bill Murray, like that was the other thing too. Whenever like you sold it to me as like, oh, it's a Bill Murray movie. And like you have to wait, wait like an hour before Bill Murray shows up. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? Well, yeah. the joke I wrote down while right while watching this was, I think Bill Murray probably did more memorization for the for his like little bit in this movie than he probably did for the entirety of Ghostbusters. Where he's just oh. no, I'm just saying because he probably you know Ghostbusters is such yeah, a riffy yeah. movie, and Bill Murray at certain points like I'm doing a studio movie, I'm gonna riff. I mean, yeah, Ghostbuster has all this science techno babble and, and, and exposition. Well, well, one thing, one thing I was I, that so a couple years I, I was just talking to a friend about this last night. A few years ago, I uh, I just really love Wayne's World, and so I I went to the WGA library and checked out the screenplay and sat down and just read read that screenplay um, because I've watched the movie so many times and and I want to see if stuff was taken up. Whatever, it's, it was kind of a fun experience too. Oh, wow. And really reading it kind of reframed how much Wayne's World. Um, is a, is like a movie. I think it's a movie about screenwriting in a lot of ways. Like, yeah. you know, like one of the first things he says is is uh, uh, what I, what I really love to do is make Wayne's World for a living, <laughs> uh, right? And monkeys will flatten my butt. It's like, oh, he's like stating the hero's, um, yeah, 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 you know, dilemma, but then undercuts it immediately. And you know, obviously, they toy with the ending and the Scooby Doo ending. And they they're constantly kind of referencing in Wayne's World bits of character and. Um, you know, like the way the villain is and the lessons that they learned. The the movie's, I think, talking about, that movie is talking about how it's written. And in this movie, I caught bits of that that felt like embryonic, like mm-hmm. um, like when the bum says, I tried to write some of these down, like, oh, this small act of generosity may have far-reaching consequences for you, you know, or hmm. uh, the the questions about being a, an artist or the, the, the doctor on the train. Like there's these things that are kind of winking at you about storytelling convention, and I'm not sure what other movies, I know there are other films that are doing that prior to this, but so much of what I found funny about Nothing Lasts Forever is in that first half when it's right. hitting beats and sort of telegraphing to me what those beats are. Like when he's, you know, asleep and awake and making jokes about the dream state um, and, and whatnot. And so, again, that's another way that this What do you is, think so- the screenplay to this reads like, Kyle? I don't know. I mean, because it's so crazy. I mean, I imagine that a lot of this was in, although I guess it doesn't feel like over edited. I mean, it's obviously a very short movie. I mean, the picture on it's probably under 80 minutes, um, it is, yeah. but it, I'm, I'm sure there's stuff missing, but it kind of feels mostly whole. I mean, for me, the movie, like I love the first 25, 30 minutes. I think it's very funny. And then sort of once he goes underground with the bums, I get a little, I get a little like, what are we doing? And then we get on the, uh, the, bus to the moon and then I'm back on board in a in a real way uh, because I feel like that's almost like goes to such a crazy place this is yeah um, that that, that uh, I want to go back to Wayne's world because I, I think you you, you kind of like got me some think, thinking about some things there but like that was kind of like one of my problems with the movie is that it felt like basically three kind of you know short movies that are kind of get kind of put together and a little bit of it is the you know, we're going to go underground. All of a sudden, it's in color. It's Wizard of Oz and all, you know, all those sorts of tropes and things. But um, it felt 
there's a very hard disconnect. So you watch the first 40 so minutes of this and it's about him wanting to be an artist and things like that. And then it just takes like a hard shift one direction. And you're like, okay, we're going to go this way. And then it kind of comes back to the moon. And I think it gets a little bit closer back to the beginning because it's more, they're, they're doing the songs again. Like they're actually going to like do like an old timey sort of movie thing. And I think some of that just feels so out of place and so disjointed that it's very hard to, follow narratively and i hate i hate to call oh it's an art movie so you can get do all that kind of thing like i feel like that's right. kind of a, an excuse but yeah well i i think the this came up a few episodes back when i had um grant g on the music video director and the format of like taking what you do in a short form and extending it to feature form like especially the first time you you it's it's right it's it's a hard thing to to sustain that level exactly. yeah. th throughout a full feature. Like it it's interesting that I hadn't thought of it. But you, I think you guys are right. This does feel like three different movies that are pushed together. But I mean, Kyle, one of the things I was curious that also brought you to this was probably the same thing that initially came to me was like this movie feels so inventive, and like it feels like a very low budget movie and I'm bad at inflation, but this was, I looked it up on Wikipedia. This was a $3 million movie. Mm. Yeah. My, my girlfriend looked that up too. And I, I did this exact same thing. I'm like, wait, is that a lot of money? And I, I think that is quite a bit of money. That I mean, in today's money, that's at least 15 million or so. I, I think like 10 to $15 million, mm -hmm. um, which would be like no comedy, no comedy is getting that kind of budget, let alone a pretty, um, you know, no star, hardly any stars, homage you know looking yeah. thing black and white not widescreen whatever um so yeah i think this was a substantial loss <laughs> for them and yeah. also like i was trying to figure out where the money is i mean there's did like, it not make its money back whenever it showed on turner classic movies <laughs> <laughs> in 2010 or whenever yeah i mean that i mean presumably this movie made like truly zero dollars right like maybe right. they maybe turner like licensed it to show it for five grand or something um, knowing how those work. Yeah. Uh, the three movie thing is absolutely right, Dustin. Because I, I, I really felt that last night. Because like once he – that middle part – sorry. I, I think it's bouncing in my mind a lot. That's kind of related to what we're talking about. But is um, – and I'm, it's killing me. I can't remember the name of the song. In The Jerk, Tonight You Belong to Me. In The Jerk, when Steve Martin and Bernadette Peters sing Tonight You Belong to Me. Right. I always loved The Jerk. Watched The Jerk growing up. And there was always this scene in it that was like mm -hmm. not funny, you know, just like them singing the song on the, I think they're on the beach. Yeah, yeah. And, but that scene stays with you, even though it's just like a sweet thing. And, and, and watching um, Love is a Dream and the other Schiller things, he is after like a vibe right. and it comes a lot in the music that sort of is, I guess the hope is that it stays with you the way that scene does in an otherwise like goofy comedy. Um, and so much of that middle part, some of that middle part, I think it's why the middle part doesn't work as well. But then on the plane, the Eddie Griffin song and the Nothing Last Forever song, that, that kind of um, taking you to a different vibe in a way and like not mocking it, but like really living within it, I think is brings a heart to those scenes that I like don't get from other parts of the I film. I feel like I read a quote, uh, it might have been from Bill Murray, but he said one of the things that Bill Murray, that they were so in lock and step at the beginning was that Schiller had a giant sense of whimsy to him, like in like, uh, that just came across like whenever you were talking to him and that comes across in the film and his mm -hmm. filmmaking too. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's fun. Maybe, maybe it's not laugh funny sometimes, no. but it's fun. There's things that are sprinkled in there that I, I, I thought was hilarious. I mean, so like when he wants to be an artist and uh, he he like does the, like he has to do the live nude drawing kind of thing. And like he does it in the short amount of time. And it comes out and all he's drawn is like the little triangle of pubic hair. That is that's, a funny that's scene. That's funny. And, uh, uh, Bud Melman. Did you catch Bud Melman was in the movie? I did <laughs> yeah, catch I was Bud like, Melman. Like, that, was, that was kind of surprising. <laughs> it's not his name. I forget the guy's name. But uh, yeah. I also laughed at, um, uh, what was it? He, I swear to Jesus Christ, Buddha and James Joyce. That oh, yeah. I chuckled at that. Yeah. I mean, I was I was dying at the the um, the guy that keeps lighting a cigarette and then putting it out immediately. That to me was like, I could watch that for yeah. for days. But again, those like little that's like a, that's like one of the few character bits you get in the movie, or like running gags which you associate with like this kind of comedy, and there's so little of that. Even uh, Dan uh, Aykroyd's uh, last scene, that which was pretty early in the movie, where he starts fighting the cars with the uh, whenever the uh, uh, the main character left, that, oh, yeah, that yeah, made yeah. me laugh. 
I was going to ask, uh, Belushi was originally supposed to be in this movie, but then he died. And I don't know if it was a similar situation for like Ghostbusters, where like, I'm not sure they got far along with writing him into Ghostbusters, but like, it sounded like a few weeks before they, they were going to shoot Belushi was still supposed to be in this. What year did Belushi die? I thought what? it was like 81. Did he, did he, was it, did he die later on? Um, does, I, I should know. I want to say 82 at the latest. So, I mean, the, the other funny story I, re- I read about this was, uh, uh, Galligan has this, basically, apparently Bill Murray was a giant dick to him while they were filming. What? And, um, yeah. No one's ever said that what? about a movie with Bill Murray before. <laughs> yeah, no one will ever believe you about that story. Yeah. Uh, no. So what happened was that um, I guess they were Galligan kind of framed it as they were still in a sour mood over Belushi dying, but he he came into rehearsals and was really excited and wanted to be Bill Murray's friend. And Bill Murray obviously is really affectionate with Schiller. And then uh, when they get into the first rehearsal, he embraces Schiller, then turns to Gallica and goes, who's the kid? And <laughs> supposedly it was a method thing. Like, I don't know if Bill Murray told him that or he justified it later. But Galligan's career is also interesting just because, like, he dropped off after the two. He still acts, but he was like the two Gremlin movies right. and this, which never got released. Well, so he went to Columbia and he was on campus when they were filming Ghostbusters and uh, he, there was a barricade and he got up to the front of the barricade and yelled, Hey, Billy and Danny to Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd. And he thinks because he had such a informal way of talking to or going with the name, they recognized him, waved him over. And Bill Murray was totally nice to him after that point. Interesting. Belushi died March 5th, 1982. Okay. Okay. So that so that would that would kind of check out the timeline of this production. Was it this movie? Was this movie on the shelf before it was supposed to get released, or did it go on the shelf after they decided not to release it? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I I read the thing about that you did about Belushi supposedly having a role in it, so I'm assuming it was like slated for sometime in '82. Well, Schiller had been thinking uh, about this movie for a while too, and he'd been wanting, like, he'd been promising Bill Murray a part in it when Bill Murray wasn't even big on the show. So maybe it's something like that. Yeah, or like, I'm sure there, I'm sure he had invented parts that could have other parts in the Nothing Last Forever universe that didn't uh, come to fruition. There's, it's, it's not hard to make something interchangeable with this movie. Yeah, which, which there might be, this might be a nice little transition piece. Somehow we've talked for 45 minutes, and we have not discussed at all the like extended spoof of the New York art scene and like German right, yeah. uh, artists, which later like is a clear influence on sprockets and the design of the sprockets shows, which Schiller did some of, I think. Yeah. So right? he, in, in the uh, Schiller vision, uh, there's like at least three shorts, the German expression, really German expression is black and white ones, which I'm having trouble remembering any of them. I vaguely, vaguely remember them, but he directed those. So, Kyle, in our email exchanges before this, you, I, Dustin and I mentioned some uh, unmade SNL scripts, and one of the ones I'm really fond with is the Sprockets movie that Mike Myers uh, co-wrote with, I forget who else, there's a lot of other people on it, and you sounded really intrigued by that. Yeah, I read. I didn't read all of it, I read the first like five pages and thought it was so funny. <laughs> I don't, I don't... Yeah, it's, it's a great script, and the, the, the tragedy behind it is that Mike Myers wanted to get out of it for some reason post uh, Austin Powers and sued the studio for forcing him to make the movie because he said the movie that he co-wrote was not good enough to go into production. And I forget what the phrasing of the the, law, the lawyer phrasing was, but it's something that was going to diminish his brand. And the, the case went for a while. And the way they settled it was Mike Myers then turned around and made Cat in the Hat, which is an unwatchably bad movie. Well, let's talk about so Mike Myers guy. Just not to fawn all over Wayne's World again, but let's to your point. Yeah, but to your point earlier about like how hard it is to take. Uh, so Wayne's World, I think, is probably the first sketch from Saturday Night Live to be turned into a full feature league film. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, like you can kind of count Blues Brothers, but that's not really the same sort of thing. Um, but like how hard that would be to do. And uh, if you remember, like Mike Myers wanted. Uh, 
I think Fellini or something to direct it originally. They asked him who to direct it. He wanted Fellini, <laughs> uh, and then he fought a lot, of course, with um, Penelope Spears. Penelope Spears. Who I just I watched uh, Decline of Western Civilization recently. Those are, those are yeah, good. it's yeah. it's that's uh, whenever that appears on TCM, I'll rewatch that. Yeah. I haven't, I don't think I've seen part three, but I've seen the first two parts, and yeah, they're but, so rewatchable. But and... like Mike Myers, definitely uh, at least very early on in his career was so heady and into this like kind of an artistic force sort of thing. Like he had such a clear vision sort of stuff. And I think that's part of the reason why um, Wayne's world kind of works better is that like they can take what is very simple, you know, of these two people sitting on a couch and, and doing this show and flesh out a whole movie versus something like it's Pat or Stuart says his family or something like that, where you, you don't really like, Oh, there's, there's not a lot of meat on that bone that we can't like, we can't, Make a character that think. sustains like a six minute sketch doesn't go into a exactly yeah and like half you know half the time on, on snl the, the sketches are too long so like you can't even make it like last that long how do you turn you know one of the problems i have always had with snl movies is the ending it always feels like they get a studio note to put emotion yeah. onto an ending and they have to come up with this bizarrely out of place arc where in and sketches notoriously with SNL, they have trouble with endings. They've think, always had trouble with endings. Sketches I think comedy movies in general have a problem with endings. Like, uh, I was reading something about uh, uh, Holy Grail or something recently where it may have been Eric Idle or somebody was like, I would never do that ending again. That was terrible. <laughs> we, just, we just had we had to have some way to like end the movie. Well, and I said it earlier, but Wayne's World yeah, exactly. addresses this directly. Yeah. With right. three different endings for you, they like don't know how to end the. We can't end the movie that way. Oh, we can't do this. You know, yeah, the sad ending. And it's it's, um, it's perfect. It is very like it has sort of sort of meta feel, but also it's just. I think it's just genuinely funny. Like it's just a, it's just a well written. There's just there's jokes in it. Like I I like jokes a lot of times in my comedy movies. You so, like to laugh. Like, you like to enjoy uh, your, your comedy movies a little. <laughs> well, I mean, like you can't like it's not you know you know. Or, or TV shows or things like that. Like, there's not like, oh, it's funny, but you don't really like laugh at it. I'm like, well, it's not fair. Like, well, and, uh, you know, I've I've had this conversation with other writers about when we talk about watching sitcoms, like in r- comedy writing rooms, where it seems like their whole modus operandi is to do joke a minute, and story structure then kind of goes out the window as long as people, or not even story structure, but just the story yeah. itself that you're telling, and. I think the, my favorite period in film, or one of my favorite periods in American film is 30 screwball yeah. stuff where they were big into joke a minute there too, or high talking, but obviously story. I, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, if I'm being honest, like those, those stories aren't sophisticated enough to go for modern audiences. I mean, you have to put yourself in the framework of watching a movie in the thirties. So, well, I, I mean, know. to, you know, to, to, to kind of piggyback off that, like that is a, that is a network note is that joke a minute is that they now have so much more oversight over reading the scripts that, uh, and this is probably in the last 20 or 30 years, but, uh, that they, it used to be kind of like it would get filmed or they would like, they, the network wouldn't show up until it came to at least a table read. Uh, but now they need to approve the script before it even goes further. And they always give the note that there's not enough jokes. So a show like, Cheers, which is clearly based off, you know, Screwball and those old kind of more talky things that they might take a minute or two to like build a scene to like get some sort of character sort of thing and then get a bigger joke off the end rather than something like uh, the Big Bang Theory or something that really has to be like, we need laughs, we need laughs every minute. And it's people are saying things that are just nonsense, but you get, you know, the, the, the laughs underneath from the either the audience or the, that's just giddy and happy to be there or a laugh track or whatever you want but um it's not as truly funny i don't think you know i think i think if you read like a script like wayne's world or you read uh you know sprockets like you like like it's funny on the page if it's something is funny on the page uh and then you give it to good actors they can make it funny on the screen hmm that's a good point i mean i i am i i'll be honest i am partially thinking of love guru right now too a little but <laughs> Are are you guys watching? Uh, this will seem like a, a tangent, but are you guys watching One Division by any chance? I haven't started. I yet. am. Um, it's uh, just the third episode I heard last night, and I, I have been like really impressed by um, specifically the writing of that show at being like modern funny, but also period funny, similar to period funny. Like they're doing an incredible job of ca- it has a little bit to do with the movie, like of capturing a vibe. 
And just you probably see the first episode is like kind of an I Love Lucy era comedy, and then the it shifts to like a more seventies Brady Bunch thing. But this makes you think about Tom Schiller, exactly, right? Because yeah. his father writes for I Love Lucy, yeah. and 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 Tom Schiller talks about growing up on the I Love Lucy set and like being in this kind of timeline or continuum of, of comedy from the origin the origin of the sitcom or one of the original sitcoms to there's the putting, there's the clip in the you know, movie of the uh, um the the candy uh, the, the the what's it the conveyor belt yeah the chocolate conveyor yeah, belt sequence from I Love Lucy that clip is actually in the movie I don't want to if we have more on this topic I don't want to derail it but I do also want to start talking a little bit more about the directors that either have come through around or from SNL too, just because SNL being a writing show, you don't think of a lot of directors that have come from it, even though it's produced a lot of movies, but Schiller being one of the first ones, although his sole feature is relegated to anonymity and underground TCM showings there. They're... He does not like commercials now. Yeah, Gary, Gary Weiss. Oh, I I forgot to tell you his his website is so freaking charming because it's like it says um, d- director and fisherman, and he has them on the beach with a giant <laughs> fish. But it shows a list of all the commercials he's directed. Yeah. So Kyle, I I kept mentioning Jim Jarmusch, like, but Jim Jarmusch was hired uh, in coffee and cigarettes. You know, you know his anthology feature, coffee and cigarettes. Mm-hmm. It was started because SNL commissioned. Uh, short for him to do the first coffee and cigarette short that had uh, Roberto Benini and Stephen Wright in it. And it aired on, it would have been, I think, um, one of Dick Ebersol's last year, I think. Or it might have been Michael's first year back. I had no idea. So he does um, Permanent Vacation and and, and uh, Trouble in Paradise and then goes to SNL? I, I had no idea. I think the this. SNL stuff was on the side just because what he was, he was he was paid to do it right. and he was allowed yeah. to keep the rights to it. And I think he only did the one. But um, when the, when SNL had their 40th anniversary special, there was one segment that, um, this is Louis C.K. pre Me Too, his Mo, Me Too moment, uh, he introduced it talking about the shorts that had come from SNL. And he mentioned... Robert Altman had a short on in 1977 around the time Sissy Spacek hosted. It would have been, um, I've never seen it, but it's supposedly behind the scenes stuff of three women and uh, the Alan Rudolph movie, Welcome to LA. And he mentions Paul Thomas Anderson, which I don't remember. You guys remember the build up to Punch Drug Love when we didn't know what a Paul Thomas Anderson movie with Adam Sandler was going to be like, but like there's all these stories that he was writing for SNL and all I got from I found is that he did this bizarre parody of this MTV show Fanatic that it was on the Ben Affleck Fiona Apple episode and Paul Thomas Anderson wrote and directed the parody and I find it's I I I saw it years ago I haven't seen it recently but it's dated it's not Paul Thomas Anderson level but I don't know how have you Dustin have you heard anything about how long Paul Thomas Anderson might or might not have written on the show no nope, I'm learning this just now he well, because supposedly that was like you, you've you've heard that he was like a big advocate for Anchorman. Whenever McKay and Will Ferrell were getting Anchorman together, apparently they'd written a script before then. And while he was on the show, I don't know if he was on there for an indefinite amount of time or he was just on for the episode when I think it was his then girlfriend Fiona Apple was musical host. But he was a big champion of that at the time too. So SNL like. And there are people that were generated from SNL, but they just made their way through at the time. Well, yeah, that's that's what I was thinking about. Because I was trying to think of like homegrown directors who like emerge from the SNL universe, right? Versus, because right. um, like you know, Penelope Spheris has nothing to do with SNL, right? But she had made what uh, Decline of Western Civilization really two. Um, and I I didn't know I I knew about Altman. I think I'd heard that. I've never seen any of these. Of course, now that you can buy these episodes on Amazon, I guess I'll just do that. But um, you know, for me, it seems like the people who've emerged from SNL are like Adam McKay, to an extent. Yeah, he's and that, that that is legit. He because he was a he was such a writer performer, and he then became a filmmaker. And 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 then um and then the the the, the Lonely Island guys who kind of go from uh you know doing viral shorts to then doing viral shorts for SNL with uh, Andy Samberg's talent, and then on to doing features. Beth McCarthy Miller. Um, is is uh, Beth McCarthy Miller right? Isn't isn't she a director now? Yeah, yeah. 
She's Has a, she done features? Because I know she does. She switched over to TV, but she was such, she was a big SNL segment director, or she was a live director, wasn't so. she? They had somebody that did show? it for such a long time, and his name uh, is skipping my 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 brain. So it's either let's say Fred or Dick or something <laughs> like that. So, <laughs> but he was like like the guy that like what did that directed the whole show for decades and decades, and then I think they as he got older, I think they started having more people uh, do more stuff on the show. Uh, yeah, it wasn't those like individual. Somebody else would do like the commercials and things like that. Um, right, right, right. And I mean, I this is one episode where I do wish uh, Ted Haycraft or normal <laughs> he would be here because he directs a lot of uh, news broadcasts. And I've been in the room with there. It's it's a completely obviously a different beast because you're just yelling, yeah. can't, you know, when exactly. to switch to cameras and getting technical things lined up. So you mentioned Lonely Island. I. Does that count because they were already doing shorts? Because you have people like Good Neighbor and then Matt and Oz. Matt and Oz was before Good Neighbor came around, but um, or was it that just a thing of like mm. they were just going to be making YouTube videos and when YouTube because SNL obviously grew with YouTube whenever they realized they could put their stuff up the next day and that like gave the show a complete new life. And then after Lonely Island was such a big hit on the show, then they're like, we need to go through people who've been making these sh viral shorts already, comedy people that have been doing this. So does it, does it, I mean, they were already making movies. Is my point, I guess. Does that count? Yeah. I mean, what, what I was thinking about with them specifically in, is, is what I think is, and, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm overlooking something here. To me, the second best SNL movie after Wayne's world is, uh, is MacGruber. Right. And I think MacGruber works because it's it's doing a character, but it's doing a larger genre. It's doing a it's it's going after a much bigger thing that connects with people. And I guess like I guess like the ladies' man may, might be doing some black exploitation stuff. And I guess there's other things that they Coneheads does, you know, fish out of water, or whatever. But MacGruber I think succeeds because it is a yeah. a universe unto itself um, that they're mocking. I and so I was. Just, I, I when you mentioned MacGruber, I instinctually, uh, I keep because I instinctually come back to Hot Rod is my favorite, and but it's not an SNL based thing at all. But that that is legitimately a like a comp. I, I just love the shit out of that movie. But now that you mention it, yeah, I guess MacGruber would be the second best SNL. Well, I, well and and Hot yeah Hot Rod similar though. It also is poking fun at genre at what like sports movies. I love Hot Rod too, but I, I think MacGruber is because it comes directly from a character. I'm right, kind of, I'm right, 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 right. That That's where my head got wrong. Got it wrong. I think in the, in the. I, 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 ahead, I was, I was going to say I think that there's like a sort of a sensibility that changes a lot from uh, basically the digital era and, and the kind of the uh, you know people now that there's YouTube and stuff like that and like uh, that there's not broadcast television. People aren't watching old movies. So uh, something like a, a Nothing Lasts Forever or even a Wayne's World or like references to things that are old because Wayne's World had tons of references to things that like I remember us watching as a kid. Like I think it just went way over my head. And then you watch as you get older, you're like, oh, that's what they were. They were doing, you know, whatever or The Graduate or something like, you know, like I didn't know that like that was what was happening. Um, right. And I, I think that like part of that, too, is like now we live in a, in a world where the references have to be so, so different. So like a movie like Pop Star is has to be so of, the you know, what's the zeitgeist in that moment. And I wonder like what the shelf life or, or like what the, how, you know, how long that kind of thing will end up lasting if it's not, you know, if it's going to be. Well, do you guys still laugh at like uh, the ad sequence in Wayne's World? Oh. Only because I remember it being funny but like like um well i know i do i, I... little yellow different That's a great point. yes it is the choice of a new generation that is a great point like that is something yeah. that like just immediately dates the show in in such a in such a way uh, that was hilarious in that moment to watch probably in the theater and for a few years after but to show it to somebody now you'd have to kind of explain that and I... you'd have to explain it a little like the the, the new print one it sticks out because it's it's like goes to black and white and the yellow pill uh -huh. um but that whole sequence is still funny because it's rooted in character, right? It's yeah, rooted yeah, in like, yeah. Yeah. we're doing, we're, we're, we're not selling out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, my, my face, oh, great. My, my Facebook picture, like the background is is uh, Wayne holding the the um, 
the Pepsi <laughs> next to his face. <laughs> it's like one of my favorite images ever. Yeah. Um, Dustin and I for years were able to do the uh, Laverne Shirley sequence oh, yeah. together. Okay. Yeah. But then like, then you even get to like Wayne's World 2. So they're referencing like so much of that is like referencing the doors, which I think is just another like very forgotten <laughs> film. So like now, like how do you like? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I so there was a Schiller interview I read um, that he did a Vulture interview just earlier this year, uh, talking about this and the legacy. And he was talking about he doesn't feel, I think he was being glib, but he doesn't feel an affinity with the digital shorts because they're digital, and he did all his stuff on film. Yeah. That's you know, I, going to him for a second. The guy, so like, he's work. He Henry Miller thinks he's his son, or has this surrogate father thing with Henry Miller. His right. dad works on I Love Lucy. He perceives himself as a as a foreign film director, he's obviously obsessed with the classic of international canon and then seems to tie up his whole artistic idea. And like, I'm sure I'm trying to imagine this guy's life. I mean, he grows up in California and, and then, you know, sort of, uh, he used it in the interview he did for Grantland. He, and I don't, I'm not good with French, but he used this phrase. Uh, it's a success destiné. It's a, 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 a six, okay. or success des, destiné. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but it means like someone who got success through critical reappraisal. And it's almost like this man was destined for that. He quoted the part in the movie where he said, you're going to get everything you want, just not the way you expected it or the, the order you were supposed to expect it in. I forget the exact quote from the movie. He quoted that. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's true. I mean, I'm honestly, just, you know, because Shane, I know uh, Terrence Malick makes two movies and then it's like knows that the critics will, will wait for 20. I'll talk about it for 20 years and then I can make what I want. Maybe Tom Schiller is like holding out for his 30 or 40 years to get his like big budget, um, you know, all the actors working for him. It seems to never really panned out. But he also seems sort of disinterested in doing it. But there's a lot of press about him. There's a lot of yeah. very articulate. This movie like has been re- rediscovered a little too. Yeah, it's it's, it's a really interesting um, uh, body of work, I guess, uh, to consider. So going back to a point I was making earlier, Dustin, about this movie, if if or not Michaels really had, a, Lauren Michaels had a lot of contribution to this, but the fact that he's not mentioned with the early writers um, there's a quote also in this interview. I don't know if it's this interview or another one where Schiller says he hasn't talked to Lauren Michaels in years and he was fired in 93. And the joke he said, cause everyone asked him like, why'd you leave the show? And he says, well, I came to, uh, came to my office in 1993 and people were packing up my office. So that's how I decided to leave. And then he tried to say like, I should have left three years earlier and the show wanted me to go. But there's a part of me cause Michaels is very, He's not very controlling, but he has noted things like he suppresses the years that he wasn't there. Um, because for years, you like you couldn't. You, I remember there was an, a glory years where they would show the the years he wasn't there on Comedy Central. Then suddenly they stopped altogether. And there's a part of me that wonders if Michaels himself has just kind of like pushed Schiller out of the SNL history slightly. I don't. I don't know. I mean, so Lauren Michaels is always famous for like not hiring people and not firing people, right? Like right. If you come in and you don't really know that if you got the job because he never says, all right, you're hired, kid, or whatever. Uh, I think it was like, what a, it might have been like a Jason Sudeikis interview where he, he says something like, well, we'll see how you look in some wigs or something like that. And like, that's the closest you ever like <laughs> learn that you might be on this show. Um, and Jason Sudeikis was like, what? Like, why is it always about the wigs? Um, uh, and then, I, yeah, and then, and then like you never get fired but like he helps people know when it's time to go or the network fires them in a lot of places um yeah i think this was before the um big purge when uh of like farley uh sandler and uh david spade just because like i mean when uh um Sandler came back to finally host, he, you know, his monologue was the song I Was yeah. Fired when, you know, and said why he was yeah. asked to leave. He's like, yeah. I was yeah. fired. I mean, there's just also the basic thing. The reason this movie has gotten suppressed over the years is the unfortunate, like, you need to clear clips whenever you put them into the movie or find a way of getting around them if they're not a significant part of the movie. I mean, have you ever had any media in your movie where you're like, we got to get something that's public domain to have something on the TV in the background? 
I mean, I don't know what you guys want to hear about this, but uh, I, you know, when you make a movie, and I'm sure a lot of people know this, but you have to have E&O insurance, errors and omissions insurance. So you are insured against being sued. Um, and so you, that quote will be higher based on what you're trying to get away with. So in my first movie, we had a random joke about Peyton Manning. And so I had to file for E&O insurance and then put this joke about Peyton Manning in it. Uh, and then they had to like review of Peyton Manning, whatever, like see the movie and, and maybe sue based on like being misrepresented or whatever. And, and they had to like, they like watched the movie and like noted that the joke was fine or it was unlikely, you know. Is and it like I, a libel thing? It's a little bit libel. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's that sort of thing. And I, I think, you know, I think fair use and those things have gotten so tricky. Like my second film, I, I film the opening credits are, uh, I filmed, uh, movies really up close on a television. So it's, it's very like scraggly, but like there are images that you can make out like John Wayne, for example, um, in the searchers. So, but like that was deemed so, I guess, original that it was okay. It you put like searchers in, that's bro. pretty ballsy, man. I mean, it's like, I'm like zoomed in on like a horse <laughs> for like a couple seconds. Um, but it does, I mean, it almost looks like art quote. I'm making air quotes. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I've, I've run into that. I mean, my bigger question with this movie coming out is like, who's this for? Like, this is, if there were to be, if Criterion were to say, all right, we're restoring right. nothing lasts forever. I don't know how many people actually buy Criterion Collection editions. I assume it's much higher for films like Parasite than it is for whatever random silent film they've done. And like, I just wonder what the appetite is for movies like this, for these forgotten. I guess I, there, there's a part of me that wants to think that Schiller had to have been, I just on a very like even immediate uh, level, like he was influenced on Kids in the Hall because Kids in the Hall had all this weird uh, German expressionism and filmmaking base and their stuff. Like I, you know, you know, Dustin will know. I always will bring up the sausages sketch. Um, like, I think. I mean, I I'm, I'm talking to you guys right now, and right behind the computer is a giant Brazil poster. And I remember thinking there was a bizarre Brazil vibe mm. to the movie. I don't know if it was just the production design and the Art Deco in it, but put into it, but or just the fact that there was imagination put into the movie. Like, I mean, it, the, there's just so much. I keep bringing this word up, but there's so much whimsy in the movie too. Well, yeah, I mean, it opens in a dystopia. <laughs> you know, it opens in like a familiar dystopia. We're in. It's, it's it's kind of mind-boggling to think about, but we're in a – California is, like, destroyed. He just, like, writes off California from an earthquake. New York is under the control of the Port Authority. You have to, like, get signed in to enter the city. It's unclear when in time we are. Um, it, it's it's anywhere from 1950 to 1980. There's – we're in – and we're watching it like it's a 1940s classic black and white American studio film. But then we jump to these German expressionist people – or German – not expressionist, yeah. but – um you know, art, the, the, the almost, I can't figure the, the design word. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's the, the whimsy. And I think that I, Brazil makes sense because there is like this dystopian dystopic, uh, entry point to the film. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's crazy, but I just like Brazil, I think has had life because it maybe was emerged a time when, I don't know, maybe, who knows, maybe it's, it's also a bigger movie. It's got more effects. I don't know. I have no idea. Also, Brazil came out. People got to see Brazil <laughs> or a version of it. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, it got some um, critics awards, but I don't know if it exactly came out. So. Well, uh, well, nothing about, at least it was released in theaters. I mean, <laughs> I guess, what I else guess was happening I mean. like in that time period? Like what other, because obviously, I mean, they're making, you get into the big, kind of the big blockbuster comedy sorts of things. So I think that like, I think Tom Schiller even said, like, uh, I might have said this earlier in the, the podcast, that they, the studio thought they were getting Animal House and they got an art movie. Um, but, like, comedy in general kind of changed there because, like, a movie like Blues Brothers, it's not what I would call, like, a, a normal kind of laugh-out-loud kind of comedy, at least, you know, in, in sort of the pitch. Or um, or then you have, like, Woody Allen doing, uh, like, like, a Starlight... Uh, or, uh, Stardust memories. Star, Stardust memories around that time period, right? Like, and it's it kind of. I also felt a little bit of that sort of vibe of this kind of anti-established comedian sort of thing that really wants to push and be an artist. Well, sort of. I always find the other reason I mentioned earlier about the Gene Dominion revisionism is that Gene Dominion uh, was Woody Allen's producer or one of her producers, and it always felt like 
um, or Lauren Michaels in, with SNL in the seventies gave this urbane feeling of uh, New York sophistication and SNL after he left NBC would probably be trying to figure out who can we get a great New York sophisticate to take over. And if they went to Woody Allen, Woody Allen said, go with Gene Dominion. Although Dominion, I think worked on SNL or was friends with Lauren Michaels because Michaels, when he was leaving, wanted her to go with him whenever he went to his movie deal too. So I don't, it's, I thought, I thought she was a producer or something. On the, yeah, a producer, yeah. but um, I don't know. It, 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 this then goes in that nebulous area of like producers do have artistic talent. They just can't credit themselves right with it sometimes. But Yeah. Yeah. And I think Lauren Michaels too, you really get to, I, that's why I kind of always wonder because now Lauren Michaels has his name on a lot of stuff. Right. He's like the producer on the tonight show. I'm like, well, is he really like doing that every day? Like how much is he like really involved? And I think what he did, did I mean, obviously he, he fostered um, uh, Jimmy Fallon and, and stuff like that is that he figured out uh, around probably the Lonely Island things, how to make a lot of things go viral and, and be like, what is, what is, you know, what can we well, quickly? It's, it's kind of part of the reason why I was confused about whether I can technically say this is his first produced narrative feature, just because the INDB list is all these things he has executive producer name on and executive producer is a little easier to say, they probably just, you know, paired people up and then they helped to get something made but didn't do much. Or in producer, maybe maybe not as much as the line producer, but producer probably was on set more or has more active involvement. Um, I Lastly, I want to empty out the rest of my note sheet. Uh, the other filmmakers from SNL I want to talk to about who I think actually fits your question earlier, Kyle, about people who legitimately learn to make movies while on SNL. So Dick Ebersol, when he came in, his whole thing was we need to do more filmed content, rec previous recorded content. And around that time, Christopher Guest okay. was a cast member and he started doing a bunch of shorts. And um, there's a few that are notable, but my particular favorite, I think is the, most everyone's favorite, is the synchronized swimming one with uh, Harry Shearer and Martin Short. And that is also the uh, introduction of the quirky St. Clair character that was in... Um, um, waiting, waiting for, for Guffman. Guffman. Yeah, waiting for Guffman. Yeah. Uh, hmm. There's also, I don't know if he was involved with, there was also the Eddie Murphy shorts or shorts from that time where there's like. Um, where he dresses uh, up like a white, a white guy. Like, yeah, Why You Like Me is a really good. There's one that's this parody of the Norman Mailer uh, book, Executioner Song, called Pros and Cons that always stuck in my head because he goes, uh, uh, C I L L, my landlord. And supposedly that, you know, that doesn't age really well, but <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't wonder why. But um, we also have um, much later, you have Mike Judge doing the Milton shorts. The character from Office Space was originally just. A, 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 was an animated short on SNL. I remember that. Um, you no, I mean... yeah. Uh, you mentioned Martin Brest put his student film on an episode with Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, Jamie Lee. I, I found that Jamie Lee Curtis says like we're going to show excerpts from uh, a student from Martin Brest's student film, and it's uh, Danny DeVito's in it. Danny you know, DeVito's Danny De in it. It's so yeah, black and white. Um, really. Really, and like, what a strange format to like. Again, Schiller in the Grantland interview, I think Schiller says, like, I'm one of the few people who's ever made money making short films. And <laughs> it's obviously just a sunk cost. Short films are terrible economic right. on all things. They are the but, minor um, leagues of filmmaking. Yeah. Well, well Martin Brest, uh, he certainly spun that into, into a career. Um, but I can't imagine like sitting at home on Saturday night and having like, oh, we're going to watch this like part of a short film, not even the whole thing. We're going to watch like, four minutes of it um it is it is interesting how they're so obsessed with length you know like even with that they wouldn't let that air for more than a few minutes and when i watched those early snl sketches like i recently watched the samurai the john uh, belushi stuff those go on forever like hmm. six seven minutes of right. and like it, and you're you're so attuned now to the 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 you know quick kidding even on snl it's so fast it's, but back very, then it's like, very formatted now as opposed to then when they're, even if you give them credit for figuring stuff out, they let things go longer. But I mean, the, the thing that drives me crazy is when I realized, and it, I realized it much later than I'd like care to admit, but that they're just reading so many cue cards, you know, on the show. Yeah. And I just started watching their eyelines when they're 
cut when they're reversing I'm like oh my god they're, they're just they're getting lines i'm always mentioning the guy just writing them and holding them up that hit that hit um, me a few years ago although so one episode i do want to bring up also is the um i was also trying to think of directors that have hosted and uh, a few years ago uh, well I, I could think of actors that were maybe directors but um the only one i can think of is francis ford coppola co-hosted with george went and the the gag was you can't really see much of this uh, except on NBC.com. With they only have a few sketches in it. It was the year, the bad '85 year, where it's like um, um, Anthony Michael Hall, Robert Downey uh, Jr., uh, um, Julie S- or uh, Terry Sweeney, and Randy Quaid that year. And uh, there's an open sketch where like all the cast members are in their locker room, and Michaels comes in. It's like <laughs> NBC's bringing in somebody else, and. I, I couldn't see the actual cold open, but from what I remember is like they play like a Godfather theme over it and Coppola's on a crane the whole time telling George Went like he keeps directing George Went while doing his opening monologue and telling him to do it differently. But also in that episode, I saw um, Robert Downey Jr., whenever the 40th anniversary uh, came up, Rolling Stone came out with that feature that l- ranked every cast member and very famously ranked Robert Downey Jr. as the worst cast member of SNL's his entire history. And I've heard Robert Downey Jr. talk about his time on SNL, and his example is like he just didn't know what he was doing, and he he would do sketches like where he would get inside a suitcase and call himself Suitcase Boy, and he mentioned that <laughs> sketch. It was in this episode. It was in the George Went Francis Ford Coppola episode where he just like puts a suitcase around him and he's just like, hmm. But there was also another sketch per your point of the eye lines and the cue cards. Robert Downey Jr. seems like he memorized his lines. Like Phil Hartman was always one. I always felt like he memorized his lines too. And it was, which is hard because like half of SNL is like they're rewriting up until the last moment too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I also wanted to mention was uh, Dick Ebersol's supposedly last episode or one of his last episodes per his idea of like putting on a lot of extra content of uh, filmed pre-filmed content. He had a special with, um, oh, I forget the guy's name. It's Billy Crystal's character though. He said, you look, oh, Fernando. The one that's like, you look marvelous. He had, and it was mostly improvised stuff. He had on Siskel and Ebert. And what they did was they watched uh, old shorts from the Ebersol years and Siskel and Ebert rated them. And gave a, a appraisal after each one, and that was one of Dick Ebersol's last episodes. Um, so winding down, do you guys want to have any final thoughts on the movie and Tom Schiller? Sorry, all I can think about is Dick Ebersol and the fact that he does so much for sports now. Like I'm just trying, I'm, I'm like, I'm like in my head about, yeah, uh, about. You, uh, you always like that's a different person, right? Like no, no he, it, it's, well, that's what he was doing, yeah. 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 yeah, just the way that network executives shift around. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, uh, you know, 10 years after I first saw this movie, revisiting it was a delight. I loved almost every second of it. Uh, I think it holds up. And I think this is, you know, SNL and, and Schiller as a, you know, I, actually, I'll say I'm more surprised it hasn't been a better incubator of directors. You know, there's so really there's very few. Um, but that might make sense because the a lot of the storytelling techniques, especially uh, I don't know. I'm, maybe they don't. I guess you're executing ideas more than you are um, nowadays than you are coming up with your own if you're doing some of these things. I guess. I mean, because like the Lonely Island guys, they come up with. I think they write their own bits. Or they were in the writer's room. Yeah. Now I've opened a whole other thing. Well, it, anyway, it doesn't anyway. seem like uh, SNL is a place that can auteurs or people who are going to, people who are doing their own stuff, you have to collaborate. The only auteur at SNL is Lauren Michaels. Yes, and and Schiller's probably the, and Albert Brooks to an extent are probably the closest they came to that. Um, so I think it's it's it stands to that, and it's it makes sense that this man has made commercials and been very successful. Um, but I think the movie is great, and I appreciate you guys uh, watching it. Dustin, Dustin, what was your uh, what was your final reaction on the movie? Yeah, I mean it was it was cool to see. It was it was like again, like I said, like I. I felt like I was watching. Gonna be, I was expecting something completely different when you say an early Bill Murray movie, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, maybe you'll be warn you." I totally shicky. didn't warn you. Did I? And then I was like, "And then, but once it started, and like you kind of get that. Like my my only my only biggest issue, I guess I would say, is that it is, is that the fact that it, like it is so like almost like a sketch, like so many short films put together, or at least three big things that it shifts tonally so much." that it takes a second to like reacclimate yourself that like, okay, now we're doing like a German like expressionist thing, or now we're going to go into this, uh, you know, more locky yeah. kind of like, or this people in the world and all that. Um, 
And then it's like, now we're going to like listen to Eddie Fisher sing a song or whatever, which is clearly just like a throwback to like, which is, I, I thought was kind of cool. Cause it's like, Oh, this is a whole new world. Mort Saul is in the movie. Who's a huge, like nobody knows who he is anymore, but he's like such like the godfather of, of, of stand-up comedy. Uh, but he's not by name, but Eddie Fisher, who's probably, probably around the same period, like uh, is, is like Mort Saul's in the movie a lot too. He's not one that did a day of filming either. I, yeah, and, and like he doesn't do a whole lot, but it's like you have this big ensemble cast, and it wasn't like a mad, 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 mad world or whatever. Like it's it's something that's just so we're gonna have this sort of scene with these people, and now we're shifting to different peoples. And I think honestly, I don't I I, I don't know that Zach Galligan did a very good job like being like the leading person. I'm glad you mentioned it. It's it's I it's it's at best a stylized performance, I guess. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's I, like that was a lot of weight to put on his shoulders to be like the one guy that is the through line. He'd only done a TV movie before this too. Yeah. This was before Gremlins. Yeah, so. so I that that, that that that's my only criticism of it. But like, there was a lot of so many cute things, and it made me like really like. After I watched the movie, I was like, I'm going to go back and rewatch a bunch of these Schiller like sort of things because like you do appreciate them in such a way where it's like you're watching a comedy show and now we're going to go into a dream sequence where Phil Hartman is going to go off and dance or something like that. And yeah. um, I love that. I, I love any time that you can like reference to old stuff versus like constantly, hey, let's make a joke about you know whatever's on TV now or the Instagram or yeah. So I mean the the nostalgia is the bigger part of it. Seems like I, I got from Schiller more than anything else. Right. Like the I didn't make this point earlier. When I was talking about the the Chris Farley coffee short. But one of my favorite things is that as that thing keeps going and going, it's clearly dated music that he put over it while it's supposed to be like a fake commercial, oh, but yeah. it's clearly like 30s or- orchestral recording. And Schiller just seems very, as creative as he is, he's very obsessed with um, the past or just their past filmmaking. And it's the, there, it creates this really great feeling of, I keep mentioning whimsy, but the nostalgia factor is a is a really charming part of all of his filmmaking. And I I don't know. I'm curious, Kyle, if when I see it a second time, if I'm going to what I'm going to think of it the second time. Yeah, I I I, uh, I, I, I maybe had overhyped it for my girlfriend, and I think she really liked it. So hopefully, uh, and that doesn't really answer your question. But I, I sorry, I'm sorry. In overhyping it, I was worried that I had overhyped yeah. it for myself, and then it basically delivered exactly the same. It was nicer to see it like on a big screen uh, and whatnot, but uh, but yeah, I think I think it holds up. It it I know that to your point, then that just means we need to see it with the crowd whenever we can go in crowds again. Uh, one way people are going to get to see a lot of stellar stuff is it's going to be a, a on Peacock, and you can see individual shorts. That was mentioned in the Vulture article that you have access to a lot of Tom Schiller stuff from SNL now if you subscribe to Peacock. Kyle Smith, Dustin Lavelle, I want to thank you both for being on the podcast and thank you for talking with me about this. Great movie. to be here. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Shane. Nice, nice to meet you, Dustin. Thank you.